Continuing where I left off, Chapter 2. On his return to Moscow from the army, Nikolai Rostov was received by the family circle as the best of sons, a hero, and their darling Nikolushka. By his relations as a charming, attractive, and well-bred young man, by his acquaintances as a handsome lieutenant of hussars, a good dancer, and one of the best matches in Moscow. The Rostovs knew everyone in Moscow, and the old count had plenty of money that year, all as estates having been remortgaged, and so Nikolai acquired a trotter of his own, very stylish riding breeches such as had not yet been seen in Moscow boots of the latest fashion with extremely pointed toes and silver spurs and spent his time very agreeably. After a, brief, after a brief interval of adapting himself to the old conditions of life, Nikolai found it very pleasant to be home again. He felt that he had grown up and become very much a man. He recalled as mere childishness, from which he was now immeasurably remote. His despair at failing his scripture examination borrowing money from Garilla to play, pay a sledge driver, and secret kisses with Sonia. Now he was a lieutenant of Hussars, wearing a cloak with silver braid, a soldier's cross of St. George, and in the company of older, respected, and well-known racing men, was training a trot of his own for a race. There was also a lady on one of the boulevards whom he visited on a evening. He left the Mazurkar at the R. Carver's Ball, discussed the war with Field Marshal Kamensky, frequented the English club, and was on familiar terms with a colonel of 42 to whom Desinov had introduced him. His passion for the emperor had somewhat cooled in Moscow as a consequence of not seeing him. He often spoke of him, however, and of his love for him, letting it be understood that he had not at all, that there was something more in his feelings for his sovereign which would not which not everyone could understand, and with his whole soul he showed the general feeling of adoration for Tsar Alexander Pavlovich, and who was spoken of at the time in Moscow as an angel incarnate. During his brief stay in Moscow before rejoining the army, Rostov did not grow closer to Sonia, but on the contrary drifted away from her. She was very pretty, charming, and evidently deeply in love with him. But he was at the stage of youth when this, there seems so much to do that there is no time for that sort of thing, and when a young man dreads being bound and prizes his freedom, which he needs for so many other things. When he thought about Sonia during his stay in Moscow, he said to himself, Oh well, there will be plenty of others like her, whom I haven't seen yet seen. There will be time enough to think about love when I want to, but just now I have no time. Besides, it seemed to him that feminine society was somewhat beneath his manly dignity. He went to balls and to lady society with an affection of doing so against his will. The races, the English club, carousing with Denisov and visiting a certain house, all that was another matter and quite the proper thing for a dashing young hussar. At the beginning of March, old Count Ilya Andrevich Rostov was busily engaged in arranging a banquet at the English club in honor of Prince Bagration. Walking up and down the ballroom in his dressing gown, he gave orders to the club's mayor Domo and to the celebrated Theokitis, the club's chef, concerning the asparagus, fresh cucumbers, strawberries, veal, and fish for the dinner. The Count had been a member and a committee man of the club from the day it was founded. He was entrusted with the arrangements of the feat for bagration because few men knew how to plan a banquet at lavishly and hospitality as he, and still fewer were able or willing to spend their own money, should the necessity arise, for the arrangements for such a feast. The major domo and the chef and the chef listened with delight to the count's orders, knowing that with him, as with no one else, they could extract a handsome profit for themselves, from a dinner costing several thousands. Be sure there are coxsomes, coxsomes in a pasty, you know. So there'll be three time cold dishes then, asked the chef, the count pondered. We can't have less than three. A mayonnaise, that's one, he said, bending down one finger. Then am I to order the largest sterlets, asked the major domo. Yes, if they won't come down in the price, it can be helped. But good heavens, I almost forgot. Of course, we must have another entree to the table. Oh, good gracious, he clutched his head. Who's to get me the flowers? Betenka! 
Oh, Matenka, hurry off to our country estate, he said to his steward, who had appeared at his call, galloped off quickly, and tell the guard to mask him to set the serfs to work at once. Tell him everything in the hot houses must be bought here, all wrapped in felt. I must have two hundred pots here on Friday. Having given several more orders, he was about to go to his little countess to rest when he remembered something of importance. Turn back, summon the major domo and chef, and commence giving further instructions. A light, manly footstep, and the jingling of spurs was heard at the door, and the young count came in, handsome and rosy, with a dark little mustache, visibly rested and well cared for after his easy life in Moscow. Ah, my dear boy, my head is spinning, said the old man with a somewhat shamefaced smile at his son. If you could just help me out a bit, I still have to get singers. I'll have my own orchestra, but shouldn't we have gypsies as well? Your military men always like that sort of thing. Really, Papa, I don't believe Prince Bagration made as much fuss preparing for the Battle of Sharkobin as you're making now, says his son, smiling. The old countess... The old count pretended to be angry. Yes, you can talk, but just try it yourself. The count turned to the chef, who was shrewd and deferential expression, looked observantly and sympathetically from father to son. What are these young men coming to, eh, Fictist? He said, making fun of his old fellows. Well, your excellency, all they have to do is eat a good dinner, but providing for it and serving it all up, that's no concern of theirs. True, true, exclaimed the count, and and merely seizing his son by both hands he cried there i got you now you take a sledge and a pair at once go to bushkovos and say that count elia adrovich has sent you to ask for strawberries and fresh pineapples you won't get them from anyone else if he's not at home you'll have to go in and ask the princesses and from there drive on to rasquilia the coachman epitak knows the place find the gypsy alushkia the one who danced at count olo's you remember in a white cusset coat and bring him here to me. Shall I bring the gypsy girls along with him? asked Nicolo, laughing. Now, now! At that moment, Anna Mikhailovna quietly slipped into the room with the anxious, busy, and at the same time meekly Christian look that never left her face. Though there was never a day that she did not come upon the Count in his dressing gown, he was invariably flustered and apologized for his costume. Don't mention it, my dear Count, she said modestly, closing her eyes but I'll go to Beshkovos myself. Young Besokov has arrived, has just arrived, and now we'll get all we want from his hothouses, Count. I have, to see him in it. I have to see him in any case. He has sent me a letter from Boris. Thank God, Boris is now on the staff. The Count was delighted to have Anna Mikhailovna take upon herself one of his commissions and order the small clothes carriage for her. Tell Besokov to come. I'll put his name down. And his wife with him, he asked. Anna Mikhailovna turned up her eyes, and an expression of profound sorrow came over her face. Ah, my friend, he is most unfortunate, she said. If what we hear is true, it is dreadful. Little do we dream of such thing. We were rejoicing in happiness. And such a lofty, angelic soul, that young Beskokov. Yes, I pity him with all my heart, and I shall do all in my power to give him what is consolation I can. What? has happened, asked the Rostov, both father and son. Anna Mikhailovna heaved a deep sigh. Dolokhov, Meyer's and Ivan Meyer Ivanova's son, she said in a mysterious whisper, has utterly compromised her, they say. They say. Pierre took him up, invited him to his house in Petersburg, and now she has come here, and that scape grace after her, said Anna Mikhailovna, wishing to express her sympathy for Pierre but by her intonations and half-smile involuntary betraying her indulgence for the scrape grace, as she called Dolokhov, they say Pierre is absolutely crushed by his misfortune. Well, anyway, tell him to come to the club. That's all blow over. It's going to be a sumptuous banquet. Next day, the 3rd of March, shortly after 1 o'clock in the afternoon, the 250 members of the English club and their 50 guests were awaiting the arrival of the guest of honor and hero of the Austrian campaign, Prince Bagration. On first receiving the news of the Battle of Austerlitz, Moscow had been bewildered. At that time, Russians were so accustomed to victories that on hearing news of defeat, some refused to believe it, while others sought an explanation for such extraordinary an event in some exceptional circumstance. At the English club, where all the important, distinguished, well-informed men had gathered, when the news began to arrive in December, 
Nothing was mentioned about the war and the last battle, as though all were in the conspiracy of silence. The men who set the course in conversation, Count Rostpachin, Prince Yuri Valimirich Dokolori, Valuviv, Count Markov, and Prince Valyamisky did not show themselves at the club, but met in intimate circles in their homes, and those Muscovites who took their opinions from others. Count Ilya Atrovich Rostov among them, remained for a while without any definite views in regard to the war and without guidance. People in Moscow felt that something was wrong, that it was difficult to know what to think about the bad news, and so better to be silent. But after a while, like jurymen coming out of the jury room, the bigwigs who guided opinion in the club emerged and everyone began to speak out clearly and definitely. Reasons were found for the incredible, unheard, and impossible event of a Russian defeat. Everything became clear and the same things began to be said from one end of the Moscow to the other. These reasons were the treachery of the Austrians, a defective Cosmorat, the perfidy of the Pole Presbyterisky, and the Frenchman Lajerin, Kutusov's incompetence, and it was whispered, the youth and the experience of the Tsar, who had put his faith in worthless, insignificant men. But the army, the Russian army, everyone declared, had been extraordinary and had performed miracles of valor, soldiers, officers, generals, heroes to a man, but the hero of heroes was Prince Bagration, who had distinguished himself in the Chagrabin engagement in the retreat from Austerlitz, where he alone had withdrawn his column in good order, repelling any enemy fo force twice his number during the entire day. And what was also conducive to his being chosen as Moscow hero was the fact that he had no connections in the city and was virtually a stranger there. In his person honor was paid to the simple combat soldier, unsupported by connections or intrigue, and to one who was associated in memory with the Italian campaign in the name of Sovrovo. And besides, paying such an honor to Bagration was the best possible way of showing dislike and disapproval of Kutuzov. Had there been no Bagration, it would have been necessary to invent him, said the wit Shinshin, parroting the words of Voltaire. No one said a word about Kutuzov, except a few who reviled him in whispers, calling him the court weathercock and the old satyr. Old Moscow, repeated Prince Dolokhorsk, saying, If you work with clay, sooner or later you're bound to get smeared with it, which suggested consolation for our defeat in the memory of former victories and the remark of Retropin, to the effect that the French soldier had to be incited to battle by high-flown phrases. The German biological propositions demonstrated that it is more dangerous to run away than to go forward, while the Russian soldier had to only be held back and restrained. On all sides, more and more stories were being heard of individual examples of bravery shown by our officers and men at Austerlitz. One had saved a banner, another had killed half a dozen Frenchmen, a third loaded five cannons single-handed. It was related all of Berg, by those who did not know him, that when wounded in the right hand he had taken his sword in his left and had gone forward. Of Bukowski nothing was said, and only those who had known him intimately regretted that he had died so young, leaving a pregnant wife and his eccentric old father. Chapter 3 On the 3rd of March, all the rooms of the English club were filled with the hum of conversation and the light bees swarming in springtime. The members and guests of the club wandered to and fro, sat, stood, met, and separated in uniform, some in dress coats, and a few in here with powdered hair and in captains. Livered footmen in powdered wigs and knee breeches stood at every door, intently trying to anticipate every moment of the club members and their guests in order to prefer their services. The majority of those present were steam, elderly men with broad, self-confident faces, fat finger, and resolute voices and gestures. Members and guests of this class sat in certain habitual classes and congregated in certain habitual circles. A minority of those present were casual guests, chiefly young men, among whom were Denisov, Rostov, and Dolokhov, now reinstated and once more an officer in the Semyavsky regiments. The faces of these young men, especially the officers, wore an expression of condescending respect for their elders that seemed to say to the older generation, We are quite prepared to honor and respect you, but don't forget that the f future belongs to us. Nesvitsky, too, was there as an old member of the club. Pierre, who at his wife's command had let his hair grow and given up his spectacles, walked about the rooms, fashionably dressed but looking melancholy in the press. Here, as everywhere, he was enveloped in an atmosphere of subservience to his wealth, habitually treating the psychopaths who surrounded him with an imperious air of absent-minded contempt. 
According to his age, he belonged to the younger generation, but his wealth and connections placed him among the old, respected guests, and so he moved from one circle to another. Some of the oldest, most distinguished members formed the centers of circle, which even strangers approached respectfully in order to listen to these well-known men. The largest groups formed around Count Respachin, Valuvid, and Narshishin. Rostov Rostopchin was describing how the Russians had been overwhelmed by fleeing Austrians and had to force their way through them with bayonets. Valuev was confidently telling his circle that Yuvarov had been sent from Petersburg to ascertain what Moscow was thinking about Austerlitz. In a third group, Narishkin was describing the meeting of the Austrian Council of War at which Soryuv had crowded like a cock in response to the stupidity of the Austrian generals. Shinshin, standing nearby, attempted to make a joke, saying that apparently Kusufov had failed to learn from Saryuov even so simple a thing as the art of crowing like a cock. But the elder club members glanced sternly at the wit, giving him to understand that this was neither the time nor the place to speak in such a manner of Kutuzov. Count Ilya Adjovich Rostov hurried and Priyaka moved about in his soft boots, going back and forth between the dining room and the drawing room, hastily greeting the guests of all whom he knew, making absolutely no distinction between the important and unimportant. His eyes from time to time seeking out and resting on the graceful, dashing figure of his son and giving him a delighted wink. Young Rostov was standing at a window with Dolokhov, whose acquaintance he had recently made the value highly. The old count went up to them and shook Dolokhov's hand. You'll come and see us, I hope. So you're a friend of my boys. Been together out there. Both playing the hero. Ah, Vasily Ignatch. How do you do? Man verbs. But before he can finish greeting an elderly man who was passing, there was a general stir. A footman ran in, and with an awe expression announced, He arrived! Bells rang, stewards rushed forward, and the guests who had been scattered throughout the various rooms streamed into the large drawing room like rye, shaken together in a shovel, and crowded into the door of the reception room. Bagration appeared in the doorway of the Anch room without hat or sword, which, in accordance with the club's custom, he had left with the hall portrait. Instead of his ashcran cap and a riding whip over his shoulder, as Roscoff had seen him on the eve of the Battle of Auschwitz, he had on a new tight fitting uniform with all his Russian and foreign orders, including the Star of St. George on his left breast. Evidently, he had just had his hair and whiskers trimmed, which did not improve his appearance. There was something naively festive about his expression which in combination with his strong viral features gave him a rather comical look. Back to Shaw and Fyodor Petrovich Yurov, who had come with him, paused in the doorway to allow him as guest of honor to precede them. Regressus was embarrassed and reluctant to avail himself of their courtesy and there was a slight delay in the doorway till he finally brought himself to enter first. He modestly and awkwardly crossed the parquet floor of his reception room, not knowing what to do with his hands. He would have been more at ease walking over a plow field in the fire, as he had marched at the head of the Prisk Regiment at Shragrabin. The club committee met him at the first door, said a few words about how delighted they were to see such an illustrious guest, and without waiting for him to reply, took possession of him, as if it were, and led him to the drawing room. It was impossible to enter the room for the crowd of members and guests who were jostling one another, trying to get a look at Bagration over one another's shoulder, as if he were some rare beast. Count Ilya Adjevich Rostov, laughing and repeating, Make way, Monsieur, make way, pushed through the throng more energetically, more energetically than anyone else, and led the guests into the drawing room, where he seated them on the center sofa. The bigwigs and most distinguished members surrounded the guests. Count Ilya Azhevich, again pushing through the crowd, left the room and reappeared a minute later with one of the other committee men carrying a large silver salva, which he presented to Prish Bagration. On it lay some verses composed and printed in the hero's honor. On seeing the salva, Bagration glanced around in dismay as though seeking help, but all eyes demanded that he should submit, feeling himself in their power. Bagration resolutely took the salva in both hands and looked sternly and reproachfully at the count who had presented to him. Someone obligingly took it from him, or would have held it till nightfall, it seemed, and have gone into the dinner with it, and he drew his attention to the verses. All right, I'll read them then. By grace and expression seemed to say, and fixing his weary eyes on the paper, he commenced reading with a serious, concentrated expression. But the author himself took the verses and read them aloud. Prince Bagration bowed his head and listened. 
the glory, though, of Alexander's reign, defeats of our Titus on his throne. Fierce warrior, though, yet kindly vain, a Caesar in the fray, a Rifius at home. The proud Napoleon, having learned thy name, dares never more thy legions to provoke, invincible bagration. Before, but before he had finished reading the verses, a major domo with a, with a stentorian voice announced, Dinner is served! The door was thrown open, and from the dining room came the resounding strains of the Polonaise. Valiant Russians hail the victory, and Count Ilya Adjevich, glaring at the author of the verses, who went on reading them, bowed to Bagration. Everyone rose, feeling that dinner was more important than poetry, and with Bagration again preceding the others, went into dinner. He was seated in the place of honor between two Alexanders, Bekloshov and Narishkin, a significant allusion to the name of the sovereign. Three hundred persons took their places in the dining room according to their rank and importance. The more important, the nearer the distinguished guest, as naturally as water finds its own level. Just before dinner, Count Ilya Adjevich presented his son to the prince. Bagration recognized him and said a few words, awkward and incoherent, like everything else he said that day. Count Ilya Adjevich looked around at everyone with pride and delight while Bagration was speaking to his son. Nikolai Rostov and Denisov and his new acquaintance Dolokhov sat almost at the middle of the table. Pierre and Prince Nevesky were opposite them. Count Ilya Atrovich, the, person, the personification of Moscow Hospitality, sat facing Bagration with the other club committeemen and did the honors. His efforts had not been in vain. The entire dinner of both meat and Lenten dishes were sumptuous, sumptuous, yet he could not feel perfectly at ease to the end of the banquet. He kept winking at the butler, whispering instructions to the footman, and not without anxiety, waited the appearance of each expected dish. Everything was excellent. With the second course, a gigantic sterlet, at the sight of which Ilya Atrovich flushed with self-conscious pleasure, the footman started popping corks and pouring champagne. After the fish, which had produced a certain sensation, the count exchanged glances with the other committeemen. There will be a great many toasts. It's time to begin, he whispered, and glass in hand, stood up. Everyone fell silent, waiting for what he would say. To the health of our sovereign, The emperor, he cried, and his kindly eyes grew moist with tears of joy and enthusiasm. The magicians immediately struck up valiant Russians, hailed the victory. All rose and shouted hooray, and Bagration too shouted hooray, in the exactly the same voice in which he had shouted on the field of Shagrabin. The ecstatic voice of young Rostov could be heard above all three hundred voices, hundred voices, he nearly wept to the health of our sovereign. The emperor, he roared, hooray, and emptying his glass at a gloat, he dashed it up to the floor. Many followed the example, and the loud shouting continued for a long time. When it subsided, the footmen cleared away the broken glass, and everyone sat down, smiling at the uproar they had raised and exchanging remarks. Count Ilya Adjevich rose once more, glanced at a note lying beside his plate, and proposed a toast to the health of the hero of our last campaign, Prince Pyotr Arnovich by Gratian, and again his blue eyes filled with tears. Hooray! cried the three hundred guests. This time, instead of the musicians playing, a chorus began to sing a cantante composed by a certain Pavel Inovich Kaduskov. All barriers fall before a Russian, his valor, gauge of victories, none but we have a Bagration to bring the foe, the foe to his knees, etc. When the singing was over, one toast followed another at each of which Count Ilya Adjevich became more and more moved, more glasses were smashed, and the shouting grew louder. They drank to the health of Blekoshov, Narishkin, Yuvgov, Dolokov, Apaskin, Value, to the health of the club committee, to the health of all the club members, their guests, and finally to the organizer of the banquet, Count Ilya Adjevich. At the toast, the Count took out his handkerchief and, covering his face, wept outright. Chapter 4 Pierre was sitting opposite Dolokhov and Nikolai Rostov, as always. He ate and drank plentifully and avidly. But those who knew him well saw that there was a great change in him that day. He was silent all through dinner. 
looked about blinking and scowling or with a fixed stare and a look of complete absent-mindedness rubbed the bridge of his nose with his finger his face was gloomy and despondent he seemed to hear and see nothing of what was going on around him but to be absorbed in some distressing and unresolved problem this unresolved problem that tormented him arose out of hints dropped by the princess in moscow concerning dolokhov's intimacy with his wife and by an anonymous letter he had received that morning which in the base facious vein characteristic of anonymous letters said that his spectacles were not as much used to him and that his wife liaison with dolokhov was a secret to no one but himself pierre categorically but disbelieved both the prince's hints in the letter but now he was afraid to look at dolokhov who was sitting opposite him every time he chanced to meet dolokhov's handsome insolent eyes pierre felt something terrible and monstrous rising in his soul and quickly turned away involuntarily recalling his wife's past and her attitude towards dolokhov pierre clearly saw that what was said in the letter might be true or might at least appear to be true had it not referred to his wife he recalled how dolokhov who had been reinstated after the campaign had returned to petersburg and come to him taking advantage of his friendly relations with pierre at the time of their useful escapades dolokhov came straight to the house and pierre had put him up and lent him money Pierre recalled how Ellen had smilingly expressed her dissatisfaction at Dolokhov living in their house, how cynically Dolokhov had praised his wife's beauty to him, and how from that time they came to Moscow he had never left them for a day. Yes, he's very handsome, thought Pierre, and I know him. There would be a particular charm for him in disgracing my name and making me ridiculous just because I have exerted myself on his behalf, helped and befriended him. I know, I understand what spice that would add to his pleasure in betraying me if it really were true yes if it were true but i don't believe it i have no right to and i can't believe it he remembered the expression that came over dolokhov's face in moments of cruelty as when he had tied the policeman to the bear and dropped him into the water or when without provocation he had challenged a man to a duel or killed the sledge driver's horse with a shot from a pistol it was an expression that often appeared on dolokhov's face when looking at him yes he's a bully thought pierre it means nothing to him to kill a man it probably seems to him that everyone's afraid of him and that must please him he must think i'm afraid of him too and in fact i am afraid of him he thought and again he felt something terrible and monstrous rising in his soul dolokhov denisov and rostov were sitting opposite pierre and seemed very gay rostov was merely conversing with his two friends one of whom was a dashing hussar the other a notorious duelist and rake and now and then casting an ironical glance at Pierre, who preoccupied with drawn look and massive figure were very conspicuous at the banquet rostov looked at pierre with hostility first because in the eyes of hussar pierre was a rich civilian the husband of a beauty an altogether old woman second because pierre in his preoccupied absent-minded state had not recognized rostov and had responded to his bow when the emperor's health was drunk pierre lost in thought did not rise or lift his glass "'What's the matter with you?' shouted Rostov, looking at him in a frenzy of indignation. "'Don't you hear? It's a toast to His Majesty, the Emperor's help.' Pierre sighed, submissively rose, emptied his glass, and after all were seated again, turned to Rostov with his good-natured smile. "'Why, I didn't recognize you,' he said. But Rostov was too caught up in the shouting to him. "'Why don't you renew the acquaintance?' said Dolokhov to Rostov. "'Can't be bothered. He's a fool,' said Rostov. One should always cultivate the husbands of pretty women, said Denis Denisov. Pierre did not know what they were saying, but he knew they were talking about him. He flushed and turned away. Let's drink to the health of beautiful women, said Dolokhov, and with a serious expression, but with a smile lurking at the corners of his mouth, he turned to Pierre and raised his glass. To the health of beautiful women, Padushka, and their lovers, he added. Pierre, with downcast eyes, drank from his glass while looking at Dolokhov for a client him. A footman who was distributing copies of Kutufo's Cantan, Cantanta laid one before Pierre as one of the more distinguished guests. He had just picked it up when Dolokhov leaned across the table, snatched it from hand, began reading it. Pierre glanced at Dolokhov and lowered his gaze. The sensation of something terrible and monstrous that had been torturing him all during dinner again took possession of him. He leaned forward, his whole massive body bending over the table, and shouted, How dare you take that! Hearing this cry and seeing to whom it was addressed, Nevskisti and his neighbor on the right instantly turned in alarm to Beskovov. Don't, don't, what are you thinking of? They whispered in dismay. Dolokhov gazed at Pierre with his clear, cruel, mirthful eyes, then that expression was, that seemed to say, ah, this is what I like. 
I won't give it up, he said distinctively. Pale, his lips quivering, Pierre tore the paper from his hands. You, you scoundrel, I challenge you, he declared vehemently, and pushing back his chair, left the table. The moment he uttered the words, Pierre felt that question of his wife's guilt, which had been tormenting him for the past twenty-four hours, was finally and incontrovertibly settled in the affirmative. He arbored her and was severed from her forever. Despite Denisov's entreaty that he should have nothing to do with the affair, Rostov agreed to be Dolokhov's second, and after dinner he discussed with Nevsky Beskovkov second the arrangement for the duel. Pierre went home, but Rostov stayed on at the club with Dolokhov and Denisov, listening to the gypsies and other singers till late in the evening. Well, till tomorrow at Salonsky, said Dolokhov as he parted from Rostov in the club porch. And you feel quite calm, asked Rostov. Dolokhov paused. Look here, I'll tell you the whole secret of dueling in a couple of words. If you go to a duel having made your will and written tender letters to your parents, and if you think about the fact that you may be killed, you're a fool and as good as done for. But if you go with the firm intention of killing your opponent as swiftly and surely as possible, then everything will be all right. As our bear hunter from Kostroma used to say, of course you're afraid of the bear, he said. But the instant you've seen him, your fear is gone, and your only thought is not to let him get away. And that's how it's with me. A demain, mon cher. At eight o'clock the next morning, Pierre Nevesky arrived at the Solonsky forest and found Rostov. Dolokhov and Denisov already there. Pierre had the look of a man, preoccupied with considerations, having nothing to do with the matter in hand. He haggard, his haggard face was yellow. He had evidently not slept all night. He looked about distractedly, screwing up his eyes as if dazzled by the, by the sun. He was completely absorbed by his two considerations, his wife's guilt of which after his sleepless night not a vestige of doubt remained in his mind, and the guiltiness of Dolokhov, who had no reason whatever to protect the honor of a man who was nothing to him. I should perhaps have done the same in the, his place, thought Pierre. Indeed, I am sure I have done the same. So why this duel, this murder? Either I shall kill him, or he'll put a bullet in my head, my elbow, or my knee. Can I get away from here, run away, bury myself somewhere? came to his mind. But even while thinking these thoughts, he looked about in a peculiarly calm and absent-minded way that inspired respect in the onlookers. Will it be soon? Are they ready? he asked. With every when everything was prepared, the pistols loaded, and the sabers stuck in the snow to mark the barrier up to which they were to advance, Nevesky went up to Pierre. I should not be doing my duty, Count, he said in a hesitant voice, nor should I be worthy of your confidence and the honor you have done in me choosing me for your second. And if at this solemn at this solemn moment, this very solemn solemn moment, I did not tell you the whole truth, I think there are not sufficient grounds for this affair or for blood to be shed over it. You were in the wrong. You lost your temper. Oh yes, it was terribly stupid," said Pierre. "Then permit me to express your express your regret, and I'm sure our opponent will agree to accept your apology," said Nevsky, who liked the other participants in the affair and liked every one in similar cases. Did not believe even that it would come to an actual duel. You know, Count, it is far more honorable to acknowledge one mistake than to carry matters to a point where they are irreparable. There were no, there was no insult on your side. Allow me to confer. No, what there is, it, no, what is there to talk about, Sapir? It's all the same. Is everything ready? Only tell me where to go and where to shoot. He added with an unnaturally gentle smile. He took up the pistol and commenced asking questions about the working of a trigger, as he had never had a pistol in his hands before, a fact he was unwilling to confess. Ah, yes, like that, I know. I just had forgotten, he said. No apologies, none whatever, Dolokhov was saying to Denisov, who on his side had been attempting a reconciliation, and he too went up to the des designated spot. The place chosen for the duel was some eighty paces from the road where the sledge had been left. In a small clearing in a pine forest covered with snow that had begun to melt after a recent thaw, the opponents stood forty paces apart at the edge of the clearing. The seconds in measuring the distance had left tracks in the deep wet snow between the places where they had been standing and when Denisov and Nevesky's sabers had been stuck in the ground ten paces apart to mark the barriers. It was thawing and misty. At forty paces distance nothing could be seen. All had been ready for several minutes, but they still hesitated. But Still, they hesitated to begin. Everyone was silent. So, I'm going to leave it off there. Thank you so much for watching. Give it a thumbs up if you like it, a thumbs down. Leave a comment below. Um, subscribe if you like. Hit the subscribe button. and Or do nothing. And uh, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.